Read the Bible every day so you'll be full of faith. Welcome you to join Bible Links to read the entire Bible in two years. I believe God will bless you, He will lift you up, and your life will never be the same. The Gospel According to Luke Chapter 9 Jesus sends out the twelve apostles, and He called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And He said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, no, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics, and whatever house you enter, stay there. And from there depart and wherever they do not receive you when you leave that town shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them and they departed and went to the villages preaching the gospel and healing everywhere herod is perplexed by jesus now herod the tetra heard about all that was happening and he has perplexed because it was said by some that john had been raised from the dead by some that elijah had appeared and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen herod said john i beheaded but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. Jesus feeds the five thousand. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him. And he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You gave them something to eat, they said. We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups about fifty each. And they did so, and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up twelve baskets of broken pieces. Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? And they answer, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah, and others, that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. Jesus foretells his death. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. The Transfiguration. Now about eight days after the saying, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem.
Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they came, became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now, knowing what he said, as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Jesus heals a boy with an unclean spirit. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him, and behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him, so that he foams at the mouth, and shatters him, and will hardly leave him. And I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answer O faithless and twisted generation how long am I to be with you and bear with you bring your son here while he was coming the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father and all were astonished at the majesty of God Jesus again foretells his death but while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Let these works sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand the saying, and it was concealed from them, so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about the saying. Who is the greatest? An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receive him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Anyone not against us is for us. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. A Samaritan village rejects Jesus. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him, who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make him preparations for him. But the people did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciple James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. The Cause of Following Jesus As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To try another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Chapter 10 Jesus sends out the 72. 
After this, the Lord appointed seventy-two others and sent them on the head of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you, heal the sick in it, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town that they do not receive you, go into the streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to unrepentant cities. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you have been done in Tyra and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment of Tyra and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The Return of 72 The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jesus rejoices in the Father's well. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. The parable of the Good Samaritan. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, 
a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think? proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. He said, The one who show him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Martha and Mary. Now as they went on their ways, Jesus into a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Amen. The following is the English translation of Pastor Moen Wu's teaching on the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9 and 10, translated by Bryson. Read the Bible every day so you will be full of faith. Luke chapter 9 and 10 marks a turning point in Jesus' ministry. Starting from chapter 9, verse 51, Luke begins recording Jesus' journey from Galilee towards Jerusalem. From chapter 9, verse 51, all the way to chapter 19, it's all detailed in depicting Jesus' journey towards Jerusalem, where he will be facing persecution, going on the path towards death, resurrection, and ascension. Jesus is determined to go there, so from chapter 9 onward, particularly chapters 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13, you'll notice Luke especially highlights one thing, the cross. Through Jesus Christ's teaching, he te sends out the disciples, he even performs miracles. These are related to the teaching of the cross. First, let's take a look at verse 1 to 9. In these verses, he calls his disciples and gives them authority and power. Remember verse 1. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. So throughout this process of calling them, he also tells them, I will provide for all your needs in life. Take nothing for your journey, no in the staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. He sends them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So this ministry is very successful. It's extremely successful to the point where in verses 7-9, to nine, Herod even thinks, Is this John the Baptist resurrected? This Jesus, I want to get to know him more. But this knowing isn't out of goodwill. It's to figure out who he really is. Oh, I killed John the Baptist. Can he really resurrect? So later on, with the five loaves and two fish and providing for all the people who followed him, from sending out the disciples, Herod stops to the five loaves and two fish. These three accounts tell us that as ministry begins, persecution will also come. Attacks will also come, and this journey towards glory is definitely related to the road of the cross. Jesus particularly instructs these 12 disciples in this passage, I want to prepare you. I want to equip you. I don't want you to just stay in receiving grace, receiving blessings. I want you to serve with power and effectiveness. Only then will you begin to be satisfied. I want to lead you into a ministry of the cross, which leads to glory. Jesus wants to do this. So today we need to pray, Lord, am I only staying in Luke chapters 9, verse 1 to 9 in my life? I have been sent by the Lord. My ministry is preaching the gospel. I also experienced that many people will feel our ministry is powerful, even experiencing miraculous healings, um, being satisfied with abundance from the five loaves and two fish among us. Jesus' ministry didn't stop there. Jesus' ministry starts from verse 18, leading us step by step to understand what true ministry is. Luke particularly records these few things differently from Matthew's account and Mark's account. From here on, it's all about the cross. From Jesus Christ's teaching, his miracles, his comfort, his healing, his provision, everything is to prepare the disciples to embark on their destined glory. So today we need to pray and ask, Lord, how much does the cross remain in my life, in my ministry, in my daily life, even in my prayers? How much of the cross's essence is present? From verse 
18 to 21, Jesus brings the disciples to the region of Caesarea Philippi, a place full of idols and many religious legends. Jesus asks them two questions. The first question is, who did the crowd say I am? Many people at that time thought of Jesus as the Messiah, someone with power, a mighty Messiah who would help the Jews overcome Roman authority. Oh, we can rise up, we can govern this entire generation. The world would end if the Jews rise, we become kings of the earth. This was the, the concept of the Messiah at that time. They thought of the Messiah in this way, as a prophet, a mighty one, even the coming Elijah. But Jesus isn't satisfied with this answer. He asks them the second question. But who do you say I am? Dear family, today Jesus will also ask us this question. What do others say about the Christ of Christianity? What do people say I am? But who do you say I am? Today we need to prepare this answer. One day the Lord will ask us, Child, who do you say I am? Can we speak of God's identity? Can we speak of God's work? Can we speak of the miracles of God in the church? But can you say what the core identity of the Lord Jesus is? He is the Son of God. He is also the coming bridegroom. Are we related to this bridegroom God? Do we have the life of the Son? Do we become the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit? It truly concerns whether we can enter into the eternal kingdom in the future. Who do you say I am? So when Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, you will notice Luke doesn't continue this narrative. He immediately starts recording what happens next. In verse 22, Jesus then tells the disciples that he must suffer. Dear family, we must understand Jesus' greatest intention. He starts bringing the disciples to understand the cross from their ministry. From the cross, they will see glory. Their ministry will be changed only when you understand this. It's at this moment Jesus begins to instruct the disciples that he must suffer. He must die. He must die in Jerusalem. So from verse 23 to 26, he begins to talk about not just him bearing the cross, but also them bearing it. From verse 23 to 26, he immediately says, For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Is it that each one of us has to take up the cross, whether it's our good self or our bad self? We must be very careful about one thing. The old self hinders God's life and authority in us. Because as long as I'm afraid, as long as I fear, as long as I'm scared, the work of the cross in my life cannot manifest God's life. Because the flesh is too dominant, I want to satisfy my flesh. I want to satisfy my desires. Jesus, this part of my life, don't touch it. I can handle it myself. I'll come to you when I need you. When I have difficulties, I'll pray, and then you can come and help me. But in my life, the part where I can take control, don't touch it. The disciples at that time were also like this. They could experience miracles. They could go out to preach the gospel by the Lord's commission. They could even, through the five loaves and two fish, receive God's care and blessing. Yes, it was abundant. But as soon as Peter recognizes him as a Christ, immediately the talk turns to the cross. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So so you may likely lose your life for my sake, but don't be afraid. You will save your life. This teaching of the cross starts to become evident. So when the disciples come down from the mountain, immediately after talking about the cross, Jesus brings the disciples to the Transfiguration Mountain, where a glorious image is presented. The appearances of Moses and Elijah are talking about Christ's death, his resurrection, and his ascension. So when the disciples are heavy with sleep, and they 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 are waking up confused, speaking nonsense, God says, And the voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. You see, Luke's account is slightly different from Matthew and Mark. It lacks that phrase, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Here there's only one phrase, Listen to him. Listen to what? Listen to Jesus talking about going to Jerusalem to suffer, to be buried, to rise up, and to ascend. Disciples, you must remember. You must take up your cross and follow him. Listen. Listen to this matter. Listen to the matter of the cross. This is where Luke's account differs. So, dear family, when we see the transfiguration of the glorious image on the mountain, we'll be very happy and joyful. Oh, this place is really good. It's really great here. But when Jesus immediately proclaims the cross, you should know that not everyone can accept it. The people back then might be like, oh, the glorious king should change the destiny of the Jews. We Jews have suffered for so long. It's time for us to prosper, isn't it? Many Christians are like this too. They believe in Jesus. Since Jesus is a true God, then he should change my life. Change my lifestyle and make my life better and better, right? It should become better and better. But how come after I start believing in Jesus, I need to take up the cross? I need to deny myself. I need to ask God to break me more. The gap in this faith is too large. 
But through the transformation of the image on the mountain, they clearly understand that the cross and glory are connected together. The presentation of a glorious image is about Christ going to suffer, to be crucified. So where does your glory come from? It starts from bravely taking up your own crosses. So when the glory comes down from the mountain, it encounters four things. The first thing is the void possessed by a demon. The father cries out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. Save my child. And, my, and I beg you disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Do you see, at the beginning of chapter 9, the disciples had authority and power to drive out demons. Even Herod was amazed. Wow, is this John the Baptist resurrected? But now, how come they couldn't cast out this demon? Matthew and Mark's accounts mention fasting. Do you see if Luke mentions it? No. Luke only records what Jesus says here as, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? This event that happens and reminds us, according to Luke, the first thing but the cross is to come and purify our hearts so that our faith can be restored purely. Because when the Lord Jesus proclaims the way of the cross, they will find it terrifying. It's so different from what they expected. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Messiah. How could he be associated with the cross? The most terrifying punishment? The death only reserved for the most notorious criminals? Nothing to do with us Jews. This is the Roman death penalty. What does it have to do with us Jews? Why does this Messiah have to be associated with the cross? We don't understand and we are confused. We don't get it. So when Jesus says, Oh, faithless and twisted generation, he's actually talking about the disciples. We don't understand. We're still living in chapter 9, verses 1 to 8. Wow, driving out demons, receiving authority, power, grace. Well, we can't live in verse 37. Why can't we cast out this kind of demon? It's because for the Lord Jesus, his authority comes from the cross. His glory comes through the cross. His power comes through the cross. We don't understand. We don't comprehend that all of this is related to my life, my authority, the power I receive, the blessings I receive, whether I can sympathize with the cross of the Lord. So my faith needs to go through the cross. That's why many people say, I want faith. I sh I'm shouting for faith. I have faith too, but every bit of your faith will go through the test of the cross. If someone's faith hasn't been tested by the cross, it's false faith. Faith is not just in peace and happiness. Oh, I also have faith. No, your faith is constantly being accumulated in suffering, in pain, in storms, and sickness. Your faith is constantly being accumulated, constantly being accumulated without any doubt in God. So now let's focus on verses 42 to 48 immediately after that demon is cast out. So in verses 43 to 45, Jesus did something very unusual. He said, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of man. So immediately from a ministry of casting out demons, he shifts to the power of the cross. But the disciples don't understand, so they don't, didn't dare to ask. They didn't comprehend it, so they didn't dare to ask. Today, we also love the victorious casting out of demons, the manifestation of the power of the kingdom of God. We love being full of faith. A rebuke and authority is upon us, and the demon does leave. The Lord has done great things among us. The demons are gone. But we rarely see what happens after the demons leave. The subsequent verses immediately after are Jesus' second prediction of that the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of man. So Luke intentionally does not mention this type of demon being cast up through fasting. Luke teaches us about a person's life. That it's related to our abilities, our authority, our glory, and it's relating, it's all related to our experience of living with the cross. From verses 46 to 48, the third thing the cross deals with is human glory. Why? Because the disciples were arguing about who was the greatest. So Jesus said, you need humility. Don't argue about who is the greatest. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. You need to be a servant. Truly seek God to break the pride within me, to shatter my vanity. That's the cross. The cross alone can make us great. What are you striving for? Is, is it glory from people's praise, the approval of their envy? Is it? Jesus said all this must grow through the cross. Without growing through the cross, we cannot truly live in the glory of God. So the first thing the cross deals with is faith. The second is your self-assuredness. This the self assuredness is like, I have authority, I just need to declare it. The cross tells you where your authority, your faith, your assurance comes from. The cross is, is where it is. The third is that the cross will break the pride within me because I long for human glory, for people's praise, for pe people to call me great. The cross addresses this. And the fourth thing the cross must destroy is our insistence on our boundaries and our old ways of thinking. 
So how do you accept people who are different from you? From verses 49 to 50, Jesus says, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. Why? Because what they care about is their relationship with people, not whether this person is in relationship with Christ. What we're pursuing now is the spread of the gospel and the manifestation of glory, but it must be done through my way, oh, word traditional way, through us. But what the cross must dismantle is people's insistence on their own waves. No matter what we do, everyone has different opinions, different perspectives, but the key is we're not God. The cross tells us to not insist on ourselves. You are eager to change others. Let's seek God to change us first, to break us, to teach us the differences between people, different approaches. But we should always respond to God's call for us, to his entrustment to us. Don't worry about how others do things. You keep focusing on responding on God entrustment in our lives. Have I been continually responding? That's the cross. Look at the four things the cross deals with. It addresses your faith, your self-assurance, like you might think things should be like this and that way, your perceived authority, where it comes from, the cross is where it is, and pride, our insistence on our own ways, wanting people's praise. And, and also for our insistence on our own way, the old self. Seek God to change us first. So from chapter 9, verse 51, it begins that the Jesus is leading the disciples into deeper work. Because once we understand the truth of the cross, we begin to live out an actual life of the cross. Through this practical, practical life, we can step onto the road of glory in Jerusalem. You'll understand why Luke specifically records it this way. From verse 51 into chapter 19, verse 44, before entering Jerusalem, Jesus preaches in Samaria, Judea, and Perea. Let's carefully examine each of his teachings in these passages to see what Jesus teaches about the truth of the cross. First in verse 51, as they set up for Jerusalem, the first thing they encounter is James and John. They understand Jesus as the Messiah and his authority, but they don't understand the way of the cross. So when they see Samaria reject them, they ask Jesus, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Jesus immediately rebukes them. You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man came not to destroy people's lives, but to save them. So, natural reasoning, emotions, and willpower all hinder God's glory in our lives through the way of the cross. And this kind of pride, if you haven't gone through bearing the cross, makes it easy for us to reject others' ways. Moreover, we're easily offended when others don't accept us. We forget what Jesus said. He would be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and he would be killed, let alone when Samaritans reject us. Have you ever been offended by others, by their reactions, their words, their expressions, even the contents of their text messages can be offensive to you and you feel angry? How can someone behave like this? Today, James and John are just like that. Jesus responds to them saying, you do not know what manner or spirit you are of. Of course, Jesus knew that the Samaritans would reject him, so he sent James and John, knowing they would be rejected. But you know, after Jesus' resurrection in Acts chapter 8, these same people, filled with the Holy Spirit, return to Samaria. Only after the filling of the Holy Spirit did they learn what it means to be within the cross, to love their enemies and turn them into brothers. Dear family, have you been offended by others? Are you unable to tolerate some reactions from others? How could they reject God's salvation like that? How could they refuse God's way? How could they reject God's words? God, God may they encounter difficulties? I've heard some... People speak like that, but we lack one thing because of the confrontation of the cross. Compassion for others and acceptance of them. So after being filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll find these apostles returning to Samaria. When they see Samaritans, they start loving them, willing to bring them the gospel, leaving them to believe in the Lord, turning the en these enemies into brothers. That's a transformation of people's lives through the cross. So when you look at verses 57 to 62, Jesus encounters three types of people on his way to Jerusalem, all lacking the cross. The first person says, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus says, consider the cost. Are you willing to carry the cross? Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Are you willing? Some people want to serve the Lord out of a passion or hobby. Serving the Lord according to their interests is comfortable and joyful. They enjoy serving in comfortable places. But if serving makes them uncomfortable, they, or they feel challenged, or they're lacking comfort, they can't bear it. The first type of person is one who doesn't carry the cross but wants to follow the Lord passionately. The second type is one who has been called but is afraid of the cross. They say, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus replies, leave the dead to bury their own dead. Don't let your spirit die. 
Hold on tightly to the Lord. Serve God earnestly now. Don't be afraid. Move forward courageously. The Lord will provide. The third type is one who knows they're called, knows about the cross, but they keep looking back. They keep looking back. Oh, the world actually looks good. Do I really have to pay such a big price? They hesitate to pay the price, feeling reluctant to commit, yet feeling guilty if they don't. They're in a state of service and struggle with the world. You just said such people are not fit for the kingdom of God. So dear family, the road to the kingdom of God cannot be without the cross. Those without the cross think they're walking a comfortable and convenient path. Some know about the cross but refuse to bear it. Jesus says, come immediately. Some are in, in the midst of carrying the cross but struggle with the world. Jesus says, don't look back. Those who do aren't worthy of the kingdom of God. Jesus' Jesus's words are weighty and emphasize how much he cares about those who follow him. Tru truly understanding the path he's about to take. So, chapter 10 completes this specific teaching of the cross. Now, Jesus sent out 70 disciples, two by two, to harvest for the Lord. In verse 3, he says, Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Jesus knew it was dangerous, but he also knew that the disciples were weak. He also reminded them, Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. This is completely putting themselves in the Lord's hands. Dear family, this really tests our faith. Just as Jesus responded to the three types of people earlier, now he tests the 70 disciples. Can you keep up with me? If you are willing to go, your status will be elevated. If people receive you, you they will receive the Lord. You can heal the sick, not just to meet human needs, but to manifest the authority of the kingdom of God. But if people reject you as if they reject God, this is a significant authority and blessing. So you can shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. This signifies that the kingdom of God is separated from them. But still, you must tell them that the kingdom of God is near. Your choice is crucial. In the judgment for those who reject them, they will suffer more than, than those in Sodom and Gomorrah who didn't hear the gospel. This emphasizes the severity of their punishment. In verses 13 to 16, God talks about the judgment day, indicating that Sodom's punishment will be comparatively lighter. Dear family, this is a test. As we see from chapter 9 to 10, in chapter 9, the focus was on the teaching of the cross. In chapter 10, when he sends the disciples, he immediately challenges them. He ch sends, tells them that they are like lambs among wolves and cannot take money, food, or extra shoes. They have no preparations, just completely trusting themselves to God. The greatest work of the cross is whether you can trust the Father completely to take care of you. In chapter 9, when he sent them out, he supplied them with five loaves and two fish, indicating that even if they had no food, Jesus would provide. In chapter 10, when you go out to preach the gospel without money, food, resources, or manpower, do you know that there is a God of five loaves and two fish who will supply, teach, help, and protect you? And your status will be elevated. Whoever receives you receives the Lord. Whoever rejects you rejects the Lord. This is such a great honor. It's only when one takes up the cross that we have this honor and status. So in verses 17 to 20, the disciples come back so joyful and they're like, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Do you remember in chapter 9 where they couldn't cast out demons? Now they understand the crust and have authority. Just one command can expel demons. Take a close look at these people. They seem like a bunch of beggars without food, water, or money. But wherever they go, whatever place accepts them, they will stay. They proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. What did Jesus say? In verse 18, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. When did Jesus say this? Not when the twelve disciples came back victorious. But when all the disciples returned, Jesus declared Satan's failure when he saw the demons being cast out. What does this mean? This statement is very precious. You need to listen carefully. Only those who bear the glory of the cross can boast before their enemies. Verse 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. When this powerful Satan fell from heaven, a group of disciples who had no money, no food, and no preparations were elevated by God, and their names were recorded in eternal heaven. Jesus is telling us something here. It's not about rejoicing in the accomplishments of ministry. Jesus is telling us that if a person is victorious about bearing the cross, they might see their own power and accomplishments for the Lord. But if a person truly bears the cross and is victorious, they will see the power and authority of the Lord. A person who hasn't walked through the cross, who hasn't who isn't someone who has, bears the cross and relies on the flesh would think, I'm very diligent and I've sacrificed a lot. 
But a true cross bearer, after every victory, won't rejoice in their success. They won't become prideful and harden their heart, like I am able to do it by my own ability and strength, and they won't be anxious, but will remain joyful, humble, gentle, and surrendered before God. When the disciples returned, Jesus immediately spoke about Satan's downfall and how their names are recorded in heaven. What is the Lord Jesus teaching here? Every victory in our lives must be seen as a manifestation of the Lord's power. Only someone who serves, bearing the cross, can walk into service. Otherwise, we might end up like Satan, boasting about our work, our kingdom, our church, our ministry, and our reputation. Oh, I am successful now, but I, will I be successful later? Oh, I would be anxious about this. Will my ministry be enough? I'll worry about this. Will I have enough money? I can do it my, myself. This is dangerous. So, when the disciples returned, Jesus immediately told them what the true joy they should have looks like. In verses 21 to 24, Jesus says, Father, thank you for your gracious will. Jesus, Luke's gospel mentions Jesus praying about 10 times, but only four times are the contents recorded. This is the first time the contents of Jesus' prayer is recorded and contains many instances of dressing God as Father. The content of the prayer is also related to the victory of the cross. When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they rejoiced. Now, brothers and sisters, like, look at ourselves. Is our joy today the same as the joy of the Lord Jesus? Sometimes our joy comes from the victories in our ministry. Many people being baptized, the church flourishing, the church being prosperous. But do we rejoice about the same things as Jesus? Brothers and sisters, you need to begin to understand the true meaning of the cross. Understand the Father's heart and see that our service is not because of ourselves. Previously, the disciples couldn't cast out demons, but now, after being taught the truth of the cross by the Lord, they cast them out effortlessly. Satan fell from heaven like lightning. Our names are written in heaven. Jesus' joy lies in that you are understanding the Father's heart, understanding glory, understanding authority. It's all through the cross. He understands that our victory today is because of God's goodness, not our efforts, not our power, not our strategies. This, my friends, is the joy of the Lord. Where does your joy lie? If our ministry is successful today, will you rejoice? We will, but your joy should be about, this is the Lord's glorious arrangement, the Lord's mighty power. I've continually been taught by the Lord through the cross. Being humbled, broken, saved from pride, saved from relying on myself, saved from relying on my own effort, saved from the struggle of the flesh, saved from my selfishness, saved from my ambition. Dear family, we can rejoice together with the Lord. Your joy must be in line with the will of the Lord. From verse 25 to 42, Jesus specifically teaches us what true love is. True love will lead us into eternal life. Because the lawyer is challenging Jesus with the question about eternal life. Jesus says that if you follow it, you will have eternal life. Since the Lord does not do this, Jesus tells the lawyer to truly love and truly be a good Samaritan. Do you remember the parable of the good Samaritan? Through the parable of the good Samaritan, the disciples also learned something. When we are offended by others, it is very possible that our lives are the same as his, and we do not understand God's grace. So we do not truly love others. As soon as you recognize love, you will understand acceptance. As soon as you recognize Christ, your eyes will be open and you will be able to serve this Christ. So that's why it's followed by these verses, 38 to 42. There are two ways of love, Martha's love and Mary's love. Martha's love is to do things for the Lord, while Mary's love is to let the Lord continually do a work in her. This is called the good portion which should not be taken away from her. Today in chapter 10, when talking about the victory of the co-workers, the disciples, Jesus shifts their focus. Their names are recorded in heaven. Later, he talks about the lawyer and Mary and Martha. Luke's account tells us something very detailed. Those who have truly experienced the love of the cross serve the Lord differently. They will let the Lord do more work in their heart to break me, to, to prune me, to have mercy on me and mold me. Step by step, I will step into serving in love. The business in God's kingdom has value only because my life has been elevated by the Lord. My, my position has been elevated. My life and my name have been recorded in the book of life. This is what chapters 9 and 10 are about. So, dear family, we really need to pray. Lord, lead me to not only stay in the beginning of Luke's gospel, chapter 9, but also lead me through the truth of the cross to chapter 10, so that I can understand you more and more deeply. Let my life truly have power and authority. Demons who have heard the gospel will flee. The power of Satan has been destroyed. Our names are recorded in heaven, and we are turning towards your love, which is pleasing to you and allows you to do more work in us. This is what we need to choose a good portion which will not be taken away from us.
Amen. Dear families, we hope that you enjoy the Bible race as much as we do. If you are willing to volunteer to translate the original Chinese teaching into English or assist with video editing, please email service at 360sunrise.com. Thank you.